All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny blue skied San Diego. And today I'm joined by Bill Higgs, who is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Probably just as sunny and blue skied there, right? It's perfect here. Yeah. And great place. Great place. Love Charlotte. It's a lovely town. City town. I always call them towns just because coming from <laughs> Ireland, I always refer to cities as towns. Um, okay. And uh, Bill is uh, he's a culture code champion and thought leader, an ardent believer that culture is the engine that drives productivity, profitability, and ultimately success for organizations as well as individuals. And today we are going to talk about how an intentional culture can actually double your bottom line. So that's a uh, Let's face it, Bill. That's a big. That's a big statement there. <laughs> Double your bottom line. So, tell me uh, first of all, um, why is it, why do you think culture is so important? And and what is and maybe let's start by baselining what what is culture? Because I, I I guarantee I could ask five different people and get five different definitions. Uh, culture is pretty much how you get things done. So if you talk to any leader, they'll say, "Oh, we see a problem, we all jump on it." or I see a problem and I direct people how to do it. But it's how you get things done is defined as your culture. So whether you think you have one or not, you have one and you can define it. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, like most, and a lot of organizations, cultures happen organically. They're, it's not intentional, like you say, it happens organically, or it basically just takes its lead from you know, the CEO or who is ever in charge. So what, what difference does it make when you have an intentional culture and how do you set about creating one? Well, we started in the oil patch during a huge downturn, similar to now where 1,200 banks went under. We started with three people, went to 6,000 from zero to a billion dollars. And what we found is we created a people first culture and we didn't realize it for the first three or four years, but by the fourth year, we knew that that differentiated us in the industry. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that happens when you get a people first culture is you reduce turnover. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge to the bottom line. In our industry, it was 45% turnover a year. Most companies, it's 35 to 50. Our turnover in Houston with over 100 other engineering firms our turnover was less than 2%. Yeah. Think about the savings and the hiring and the training and the efficiencies and all those types of things. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about some of the building blocks for culture, because I think sometimes, I mean, you say like a people first culture, and sometimes I think people think, uh, they immediately think of Silicon Valley and they think, oh, of you know, pool tables and massage chairs and all of this kind of stuff, you know. But that's all, you know, I mean, a lot of that stuff is all kind of a veneer. What is the reality? What does a people culture really mean? And at the end of the day, we're not talking about coddling people either, are we? We're talking about performance. No, it's uh, respecting and valuing people. Mm -hmm. And from the outside, you would look at our culture and say, man, that's a really nice, fuzzy, warm, cuddly culture. Like we're holding hands and humming every mm -hmm. day. <laughs> but that was a thin veneer right under that. If you weren't producing the system, the people would push you out because they right. just wanted to be working with good people. So one of the things, I use lots of little phrases to try and work the culture. One of them was Operation Horse Thief. So we were a Mustang, a horse company. Mm -hmm. Operation Horse Thief is talking to your people and say, who are the best, best five people you've ever worked with? And those would go on our list to go horse thief, and go find those people and get them because we knew they would have our DNA. So the right. key thing for culture is hiring correctly and finding people with your DNA that'll work the way you want to work. Yeah. And obviously, in order to do that, you have to have figured out what the right type of person looks like, what the traits and characteristics are. Well, and some of that comes from just creating a performance and a meritocracy type of culture. Mm -hmm. And then people don't want to carry the people that don't work and they want to bring in people that they know are going to help produce and make the company healthy. We had a downturn every three or four years. So if you weren't good, you went under. 
Yeah. And let's face it, I mean, the way things are going now is we seem to have a major catastrophe every, you know, <laughs> four or five years now. I mean, I've been in a, I've been in the States 30, 23 years now. I came in the dot-com era, so I've been through the dot-com implosion. I've been through 9-11. I've been through the financial crisis and now COVID. So, <laughs> it's, uh, um, so here's the thing, right? So part of it is if you're going to have a culture, high performance culture, accountability is obviously critical. But the trouble with accountability is when you mention it to most people, they'll say, yes, absolutely, there should be accountability. But they always mean holding you accountable rather than themselves. So how do you foster this a culture that starts with personal accountability? One of the things we worked hard on was busting all the silos in the organization mm -hmm. so that we got good communication. So we cross-trained people to where they would know each other's job. And then you get that personal accountability and what we call is working both ends of a handoff. So if you communicate with the person you're going to hand off to and give it to them in good shape on the day you said you were going to give it to them, we essentially built our company on squeezing handoffs. There's 30% dollars in schedule savings available in the hundreds of handoffs that happen every day. So if you can bust the silos, work the communication, work those handoffs, now it's people won't say it's holding each other accountable but they're going to meet those deadlines with a quality product. And that's the accountability that you want. And it just starts to happen naturally. Yeah, because obviously, like you said, silos, breaking down silos are important. Because, I mean, a lot of people instinctively, you know, subscribe to the idea that good fences make good neighbors, right? And, and when they bring that into organizations and they do, well, we're doing our piece and let's just focus on our piece and we'll pass it over. And if they don't do their piece, well, then that's their problem. But that that doesn't work. No, and what I've found, and everybody's seeing it now, in every downturn, the first thing to bust is all the silos mm -hmm. because now everybody's in the soup together. They can't yeah. hold their turf. They can't do anything. They need to talk to each other and figure out how to get through it, really hold hands. So right now is the perfect time when the communications is there to start intentionally developing that culture to come out stronger at the other end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you don't want to be waiting uh, for a crisis to suddenly peep your head over the fence and say, oh, hey, uh, could you help me now? <laughs> <laughs> no, one of the things that we did, and I encourage people now, is take notes of everything that you've cut and fixed during this downturn. <laughs> and when times come back and they get good, look at that list and see if you're falling back into your old ways. Mm -hmm. And if you can stay lean in the good times, like you said, every three or four years, there's something else going to yeah. happen. If you can stay lean, we never went down in the downturns. That's how we grew because we stayed lean in the good times. It's tough. It needs to become yeah. a habit. No, I 100% agree with you. And, and we definitely subscribe to that ourselves. Uh, but, and the point being is that, you know, because it's very tempting in the good times is to, oh, as you say, overlook efficiencies, throw people at issue. Instead of, instead of looking at how can I make it efficient, how can I do things better? It's like, oh, I'll just hire somebody to do that. I'll just hire somebody to do that. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you've got a bloated, inefficient organization that's fine when the going is, is really good, but it's pretty awful when the downturn comes. Yeah, everybody's fat and happy, but then yeah. that doesn't work in the downturn. And, and I think the other thing that needs to happen in downturns is the leadership. You've got to stay positive. You've got to keep creating those good memories and putting smiles mm -hmm. on people's faces, even in the middle of downturns, yeah. because your people are looking for that. Show us hope. Show us where we're going. And the leader needs to help drag them along and be positive. It, if nothing else, you'll get them up to neutral. Yeah, no, exactly. And and that doesn't mean like pretending you have all the answers, because that's not what people are looking for either, is it? I mean, they're yeah. just looking for you to say, here's what I do know. Um, here's what I don't know. But here's the, here's the best thing that we think we can do right now. So it's really the communication. And I think honest communication is what people really, really uh, uh, look for at a time like this. That was one of the funny things when new people would come in. If we put a memo out or information out, normally whatever management says, people believe that it's 180 degrees opposite of what's right, coming right. out. Yeah, yeah. 
And our people would have to tell the new ones, no, no, you can actually believe what these people are saying because they were just like us three years ago. They were employees. So they, they don't <laughs> like, believe in the, the BS. Yeah, it's like they, they have that joke in, in, in England in, in soccer, you know, that uh, when the board of directors gives a manager the vote of confidence, you can be pretty sure he's about to be fired. He's on his way out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so what are some of the other practical things that you can do to build a high performing culture? One of the things that I pushed a lot is, and you might laugh at this, is hard copy communication. Mm -hmm. So I would actually send the newsletter letter hard copy to the house. Because if we could, the spouse will read everything in a newsletter. Mm -hmm. And if there's pictures of kids, they can show them to their kids. But what we found is we wanted to win the hearts and the minds of our people. And if we started doing things at the house, and so when we would do a skating party, there were toys for the kids, and they were all had our logo on them, had our mottos on them. And what happened is when the family started being part of the Mustang family, it made it easier for the employee to even work harder or stay Saturday if they needed to. And it made it harder for them to move because their kids mm -hmm. would say, my toy box, toy box is full of Mustang stuff. You can't leave that company. <laughs> and so I think getting the hearts and minds. If you can hard copy some things to the house, it'll help you. And we also did hard copy communication at the coffee bar. Once you get back into the office, put positive things at the coffee bar and take those rules and regulations that everybody has posted and stick those in a dark corner somewhere in a hallway. Yeah, Nobody exactly. cares about that. Stuff. Darker the better. <laughs> yeah. But at the coffee bar, make it a positive experience and that positive experience will go down the hallway and back into the work. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And especially the, you know, nowadays when people get everything electronically, that I mean, maybe a little bit of old school hard copy might actually be, uh, be well received. The other thing, though, um, Bill, that I wanted to touch upon is, yeah, so we are in this, we are in this strange world right now with the pandemic. And a lot of people are, you know, having work remotely or work at home and all of that. And it's an adjustment. How much do you think going forward, part of the culture of an organization will be how they can accommodate people's situations, uh, you know, more, you know, be more flexible in how they can accommodate people's situations, but at the same time with the quid pro quo that they get as much, if not even better performance out of their, their employees? Uh, I, I think we just jumped 15 years in the future with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody was realizing they could work remotely, but nobody was comfortable starting to move in that direction. This forced it to happen. I think there's going to be a lot of open office space <laughs> coming. Yeah, and And I think companies will keep a portion of their workforce working from home, and they may actually rotate that. Because once you've set the systems up and you've got – all the electronics working, you don't want to lose it. And what I found is when you're working electronically, you're working harder on the communications, you're working harder on the handoffs, which is all of the, you're documenting it better, which will make them even better when they do go back into the office. But I think we've got the new normal and 30% of people are still going to be at the house. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we as a company made a strategic decision five years ago to be largely virtual because we saw a lot of benefits in it and we actually found it to be more productive and efficient. And I think you're correct. I think a lot of organizations are now discovering that for the first time, but it does come with its, for some people, it does come with their challenges right now. And particularly if people have kids at home and stuff, we're not going back to school, um, you know, hope, not as soon as we would like them to. It will require a little bit of flexibility, but I always think that the way to make these things work is just to be open and honest, is, to like, is for the employee to say, here is my situation, and for the employer to go, okay, let's figure out how we can work together and find a solution that works for both of us, and we can still both get what we need. And some of it's having trouble establishing a working space at the house, sure. which I think some people are struggling with. But I think from an employee standpoint, uh, right now, I think leaders know the spouses, they know the kids, they know the family situations way better than they've <laughs> ever known them before. And there's a lot of help going both ways. We can actually, in engineering, we can measure productivity. And we're at about 105%. And it's because we don't have the travel back and forth. And sure. 
and maybe not as many breaks during the day. But I think some cases people are taking a break in midday and then working a little later because they're at the yeah. house. But uh, we're getting really good productivity from people yeah. at the house. And, and, you know, and maybe what they're doing, maybe at lunchtime they're going for a run around their neighborhood. Maybe they're spending some time with their kids, whatever it is. I mean, there's a lot of positives, uh, you know, to all of this. So, so I think that's something that people absolutely, absolutely need to consider. Uh, and then I just think it's, it's in many ways, I think you'd agree, is we have to kind of break the mold of what we think traditionally a business looks like. Definitely. Uh, the organization structures are going to change. I think uh, you're going to see some much smaller teams. You're going to see more millennials put in charge of three or four people and say, hey, start leading these teams and let's create a new way of working. So there's some really cool changes going to be happening over the next 18 months. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as what would you advise any organization now who is starting to sort of look at the future and say, OK, this is over? what are some of the things that you think that they should focus on? I think one of the key things now that they have the communication, the next thing that we really worked hard on was to create that sense of team. So we had a lot of swag, goodies and things that we handed out, uh, mottos, dances, all kinds of themes, so it's a lot of the fun stuff. But we also wanted to create that team that other people wanted to join. So if you can get it to where there's a list of people fighting to get into your company, mm. quality comes through choice. If you've got choice, you can pull in the best people. And so what you want to do is get that uh, flywheel starting to spin where you're creating this team and the word's getting out in the industry that – wow, this is the gung-ho place. This is the place to work. Leadership's engaged. Top to bottom, we have communication, and everybody's pulling in the same direction. But then one of the key failures that I see, especially in mid-sized to small companies, is you need to sell while the shop is full. Mm. A, lot of, a lot of companies, they get loaded up with work, say, coming out of this uh, pandemic and this economic downturn. All of a sudden, they get too much work because they've reduced staff by 30%. So the immediate thing is, man, our quality is going to go down. Let's turn down work and just focus on what we have. And you can't turn sales on and off. And so yeah. I always say, sell while the shop is full. Nobody cares if your company lives or dies. You're the only mm -hmm. one. So yeah. take on that work. And what I found is when I would overload my people, they would come up with more efficient ways to get it done. And then those efficiencies would help me earn more work. So sell while the shop is full was one of the mantras that I had. The other thing I said, I, it was job on the corner of a desk. If you'll put a job on the corner, somebody's desk and say, hurry up what you're doing and get done so you can get on this mm -hmm. job. Now that person feels job security. When they feel job security, now they have energy to engage in your culture drive. <laughs> if they don't have job security, they don't care about all your culture mm -hmm. stuff because they're looking for the next job to pay their mortgage. Yeah. So if you can sell while the shop is full, keep a job on the corner of the desk, now your people are going to totally buy in. And then you can start moving the needle on your culture you get that intentional culture, you're going to reduce the turnover, big dollars, the bottom line, you're going to increase efficiency, which means you'll have more work. And you can choose the work you take, turn down what you don't, you know, the lower profitability jobs. And that's why our profitability was four times industry average, I say you can double it. Hmm. I know that's easy. <laughs> we, were, we were four times. And so I know it works. We did it in eight industries, 12 international offices. We had a young guns program to teach young people. Mm -hmm. After 15 years, young guns were all the way up to CEO of the company wow. running international offices. So get this flywheel going. Now's the time to do it. And But you got to get people to know that your company's going to be around. They've got a job. Yeah. 
And always remember that a flywheel doesn't start off fast. You have to, yeah, you, you have <laughs> you to push keep it. Pushing at it. You got to keep pushing. Yeah. yeah. Listen, Bill, this has been fantastic. Some fantastic insights there for people. And to be honest, I guess things start to open up again. Now is the time to look at what you, what you, what culture you want, how you want your company to be going forward, what lessons you're going to learn from this, and how you can set yourself up so you can be a company like Bill just described, the one that can ride the waves, whether they're big or small. All right, listen, thanks very much. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. All of Bill's information about his company, everything will be in his contributor bio. But before we go, Bill, just tell people a little bit more about yourself and what your company does. So we're an engineering firm that did offshore all platforms, but then we moved into automotive and industry and various uh, different product lines across time. Change was continuous. We called it the Mustang motion. And if you can get people to where they embrace change, you'll be a differentiated company. My whole thing was if you can intentionally work on culture, you're going to improve people's lives. And what we found is spouses would come up to us at Christmas parties and say, my husband or wife has changed since coming. They get up in the morning ready to go to work. They come home, they've still got energy to engage with me and the kids. They're even talking about going to church on Sunday. Hmm. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And it would just send chills up and down our spine because our industry was one where it was higher and fire depending on the work. Right. And we just changed the industry, essentially. You can Perfect. do it. That's fantastic. All right, well, listen, Bill, thank you very much for joining me today. And I'll see all the rest of you for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jan.